My friends, my name is Ian, and today we're talking about Christine Widmeyer's uh, Just a Dish, Power Dynamics and Gender Roles in Making Humus Kibbe. Uh, I really, really loved this article. I thought it was an interesting, I mean, for no other reason, if for no other reason, then it's a great argument for ethnography. It's a great argument for why studies of the specific are useful in discussions of the general because she covers so many different things in the making of one dish by one family by one person and you know the the, the, the way the dish exists in that family for a number of years and so uh what what gets me is all the various dynamics that are in play because as i said she touches on a whole host of different materials one of them has to do with the very role of quote unquote ethnic food for families of well she's third fourth generation chaldean so she's not exactly what we might immediately consider an immigrant family and a term that we often uh limit to people who are perhaps only one or two generations. Uh, she, her family, Chaldeans, a uh, group from Iraq, have been in the Detroit area, as she says, for since the 1920s, better part of four generations. She's talking basically about her great grandfather's um, immigration. And her, that Chaldean identity was important and critical. How's that looking? How's that looking? I have, uh, just to let you know, I made the beef ahead of time. I'm making the hummus, uh, the hummus kibbe, uh, for the very first time. Professional television bloggers would probably have done this three or four times. I am doing it as we go. I browned the meat. I made some variations. I followed her recipe. I followed another recipe for Cal for it uh, that I found online, just to help me with proportions and seasonings. Uh, because I'm very much like Warren, uh, Christine's father, in that I kind of need a recipe when I go, certainly for a new thing. And also, in many ways, I'm a lot like Beth, Christine's mother, in that I am sometimes reasonably confident with a recipe and confident about my own abilities. But um, nevertheless, when I'm trying something new, especially when the food has is, is as embedded in meaning as this is for their family, I, I want to be careful with it. I want to be respectful of it prior to what might be my next uh, expectation, which is to be uh, more experimental and more adapted to my own tastes. So, um, as all families are, well, not all families, by any stretch of imagination. Sorry, forget I said that. As families t often are, uh, every generation has a confluence of a number of different influences. Uh, Christine's, uh, the, the Chaldean heritage comes from her father's side, and it's a source of great pride and source of a, a familial um identity that that marks them as distinct from friends and neighbors and so on and marks them distinct in the school and particularly i think probably she she adverts to it very briefly towards the end but because it is um because chaldea the chaldeans uh, come from iraq during the gulf war there was a uh, the family war this is what iraqis this is what an iraqi looks like buttons to sort of demonstrate the 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 pure American and the pure ethnicity that is going forward. But one of the things she demonstrates, and she gives a brief history, which I won't reiterate, is that it's through food ways that that identity is most often enshrined. And it's that's the same for many. After, after language tends to disappear because there is a tendency to assimilate, uh, and there's not necessarily much of a rationale beyond the symbolic to uh, retain language. 
And uh, often after, you know, because of size of the community, maybe participation in the church, uh, if there was a, and there is a distinct Chaldean Catholic church, uh, tends to uh, uh, give over to other denominations. And so by the time of uh, Christine's generation, they were uh, participants in the Roman Catholic, in the Roman Catholic church and were not, did not participate in the Chaldean church. Um, the, the general processes of Americanization, the general processes of, uh, um, you know, being modern and not a hundred percent all the time as, I mean, everyone is always modern to their time, but they're not necessarily always engaged in this process of identity reaffirmation or distinction markers. Those distinction markers happen, uh, more often at uh, times of festival, times of, uh, uh, rites of intensification, and these festive foods, they take on this different meaning. What might have been quotidian foodways uh, in the originating country uh, now are uh, chosen. They're chosen, they're enacted, they're performed, and they're done so because they are, at times when it is good, at times when it is decided to be good, to reaffirm that sense of identity. And, um, but, you know, often they involve processes, especially if we're talking about um, ingredients and if we're talking about recipes from generations past that might be much more time intensive, do not necessarily um, uh, lend themselves to modern cooking technologies or similar to that um, because of the nature of the traditional aspect of them, um, modern conveniences are eschewed. And of course, the performance of them is part of it. The, the making of it is part of the process. It isn't simply the production, or the, it isn't simply the product of that production. It is, it is the, the producing that is important. So sometimes modernity or modern uh, conveniences are deliberately eschewed because this is how it was done, or this is how parental generations, which is why we, think of, we should think of cooking as much as performance as the, the meal that might ensue because it is a process of deliberate acts. So the Chaldean food had come through her father's side and that was also fraught because his mother, the, who was the, uh, the Chaldean, as it were, she had married a German American or some German American, um, had uh, died when Warren was young. Well, Dorn was, Dorn, uh, Warren was 19 and uh, they did not have a good relationship with the father and the family kind of ended for a couple of years and it had more or less um, he was sort of more or less on his own separate from his family when he married Beth Christine's mother or when he, when they met I should say um, meanwhile Beth was a cook was a cook her entire life through the general expectations of the home uh, when her mother was young she broke a wrist and she had to uh, um, Beth had to take over the cooking for a while, and uh, she became quite adept. And it's that wonderful, creative, and yet not necessarily enviable role of the, uh, the, the blend of the expectation of this is something that you, you should be doing, uh, you know, falls on her as daughter, even at the age of nine, to be cooking for the family when the mother can't. Uh, but also the validation that comes from being recognized for one's efforts. And so Beth had her entire life basically been, uh, been a cook and uh, had recipes and was very adept in the kitchen and was very adept at improvising and very adept at being confident and knowing what she liked, knowing how ingredients worked and putting them together. So as she was making her foods, uh, she, she, she learned her family's repertoire, her family's tastes more than anything. It wasn't simply the the um, replication of recipes, it was creating within that set, that set of expectation, being able to not only emulate, but improve upon, being able to create within a set frame. And she went off to university, she went to San Francisco, she was exposed to other foods. She wasn't yet making foods. She wasn't yet experimenting with foods that were outside of her um, sort of home cuisine. As a cook, she was as an eater. She moved back to Michigan. She uh, met Warren 
uh, and they started slowly at first, not not much at all, because they were um, living in Ann Arbor, so surrounded by restaurants, and she was working as a waitress occasionally, got free meals, so didn't cook much. But then eventually, uh, as they became a couple, she started cooking, and they started cooking more adventurously. Uh, and they actually had a deliberate effort at cooking uh, new recipes. One When that was happening, Warren, who for a variety of reasons, including, of course, patriarchy, and this is not a diss on Warren, uh, did not have a background as a cook and did not have the natural facility, was a good cook, but didn't have that sort of embedded, embodied practice that Beth had. So he was much more recipe-oriented, as I, I've already suggested. Meanwhile, Beth was much more confident in her abilities, her confidence, confidence in um, improving uh, recipes. And when we improve a recipe, fundamentally, we are adapting it to not simply our tastes, but to what we know to be the tastes of the people that we are making it for. So adaptation is not a matter of merely throwing away the original and or disposing of it or being indifferent to it. Uh, adaptation is, like all performances, it is taking this type it is sizing up the audience and sizing up one's own taste, a literally taste, in the case of a narrative, of course, metaphorical taste, but the expectations, the aesthetics, what has worked in the past, and making it new. And sometimes that involves um, something, sometimes that involves Goldilocks eating something apart from oatmeal. Sometimes that involves putting garlic in the hummus kibbeh. So, Warren and Beth were together. Warren was sort of, I mean, it's difficult to call a 19-year-old an orphan, but he was, the, fa the family had sort of more or less split apart. And then they started to reunite. The, the siblings, his siblings, got together and, and, that, and got together actually in their kitchen and started to reune. And one of the things, one of the ways they started to reune is they got in touch with their mother's family, the Chaldean family. And their Aunt Rose, Warren's Aunt Rose, Warren and his siblings' Aunt Rose, um, had a long buffet of Chaldean food. And the memory of the food, uh, the memory of that event for Beth, as she says in narrative, she tells Christine this through interview, is that she doesn't remember much in the way of the food. She doesn't remember much of her reactions to the food. But she remembers Warren excitedly pointing everything out, saying what it was and how much he was enjoying it. That this was a taste of his past, that this was a taste of his mother's kitchen that needed to basically be, that, that he was introducing her to and that clearly was affective. It was clearly moving for him. And over the next couple of years with the family starting to reunite, up to and including Warren's estranged, pseudo-estranged father, who wasn't Chaldean, but had liked the food and, and uh, was presumably starting to make amends with the family, who also came to uh, Rose's family reunions. Uh, cooking became a part of it. Rose started introducing how to cook these events, how to cook these foods. Um, and they became family opportunities. The actual act of cooking, both at family reunions and then through Beth and Warren, as they had children, Warren would be making food with his kids, including Christine. And um, that was a way of Warren tying in to his Chaldean heritage, to communicating his Chaldean heritage to his kids, to his family, long after, you know, when there is very little else that they can do because they don't have the language and they don't have other forms of display. Uh, they do have the food. And so he would be making the food. Which brings us to the ethnographic present, uh, where Christine gets a call from her mother, or, or Christine calls her mother on a conversation with her mother. Um, her mother reveals that she is going to be making Chaldean food for Warren very excitedly and had never done so before. And what prompted it was how Beth's mother had died and Warren had been very good. If you've ever lost someone uh, and have to deal with grief and you have a partner who helps you, 
you are indebted to that partner. Uh, and she wanted to do this as a way of demonstrating uh, thanks, of, of giving back to that because he had been so very supportive in this traumatic moment. And you would almost think, if you were reading it quickly, you would almost think that uh, it was uh, that she had now taken it upon herself to make Chaldean food because that chain had disappeared because his, his mother had died. But no, it was hers. And so she wasn't trying to take over the, the matrilineal, a direct matrilineal uh, food, food habit. She was engaging in something that she had all the opportunity in the world to, but had sat back from doing before because this was her, her husband, her husband's family, and her children's heritage, but not hers. She found it fascinating. She found it intriguing, and she did love the food, but she, she had stepped back from making it. And that encouraged Christine to do an ethnography of her mother making this food. Uh, and as I said, one of the great things about this article is, is that it demonstrates the power of ethnography. So, and by looking at the specific, we get to, we've already touched on some of the, the, broad, uh, the broad patterns that, that she's able to, to tap into. How food becomes um, culturally laden with meaning um, within immigrant second, third, fourth generation communities because other expressive forms might start to disappear, how it is a way of introducing someone to, to the heritage. Beth knew that her uh, betrothed or, or her boyfriend at the time, whatever Warren was at that exact moment of the family reunion, was, a, um, was Chaldean but hadn't really had much exposure to the family and didn't necessarily know what that, all that that implied. So it was almost a statistic. And, and, and you know, in the way that heritage is sometimes, you know, it is something that one is, not necessarily something that one inhabits. And it was really only at that first family reunion that she got a sense of what it was. And that, that way that we think about food as being a communicator and, and that it's a, it is a way of communicating a place, a time, an ethos, a worldview that first of all doesn't require understanding because it's experienced through the senses. It, you, you can understand it, you can make sense of it, but it is a first and foremost a sensory experience. And it can only, it can be understood, but it can't be understood without that sensory experience. It can only uh, it's only in the pure abstractions. So um, then the deep study, the ethnographic study of the actual making of it, where she describes, um, she, did, she walks us through the recipe, but more importantly, she, dem she points out a number of different moments. First of all, that, well, she was dealing, working from a recipe. She wasn't making it up as she went along. Beth was working at it from some kind of crib sheet. And um, it's also, it went without saying that, uh, and it went without comment that the recipe, uh, despite it being a traditional Chaldean food, used things like a package of cream of wheat as a standard reference. So, uh, you know, already we're dealing with a traditional food that is simultaneously within a modern and contemporary food economy. I mean, cream of wheat has been a pr commercially produced food for over 150 years, but it doesn't date back to Chaldea. It's it's a uh, American uh, intervention already into traditional Chaldean food ways. I'm getting well. No, actually, this one is not particularly great, but some of these are pretty good. Um. So. She's already playing with the recipe, but she's hesitant. She, whereas, as we've already established, Beth is remarkably confident in the, uh, in the kitchen, that she can adapt, that she can, she knows what she likes, and more importantly for her, not for our purposes, but more importantly for her, she knows uh, what... Uh, her family likes, and particularly what her husband likes. And it's particular not because she's demonstrating per, uh, rather intense uxorial responsibility, 
But more to the point is that she is making this dish for him expressly as an act of thanks, as an act of gratitude, and as an act of uh, trying to meet his taste expectations that aren't simply his palate, but his community, his sense of background, his sense of family, and so on, and more or less signal that this food can continue. There are elements that, that are sneaky, and again, not disingenuous, but sneaky, and that one of the benefits of this food is that both of them like it. Both of them like it. It is palatable, whether or not it coincides with a sense of identity. Another thing is that it is a basic stew, because afterwards, and I don't think I'm going to be doing it in this video, but uh, maybe I'll subsequently film it and there'll be special bonus content. Um, uh, the meatballs are then cooked in a tomato-based uh, stew, in a tomato-based broth, and uh, that comprises the meal. And that meal is what uh, is, can be left on the stove until Warren comes home, because Warren is a bit of a workaholic and often works late. And so, and as the kids have more or less moved out of the house, it is just they two. It's a food that they will both like, that he likes, he doesn't get the opportunity to make. In fact, he might only really make it for his children when they're doing that celebratory aspect. So he's able to, she can introduce it to his palate more often, to into their food repertoire more often, uh, while also it being something that she can leave, leave and set. She continued her life as a cook. Um, and by life as a cook, it's in addition to her modern and contemporary professional life and where she was first a lobbyist for healthcare, and then she quit that uh, when, uh, and w went to uh, write her novel, and so basically stayed at home. But she had always been the primary cook. Warren, especially after their first couple of years, he worked more. Um, he was a lawyer of, with his own law firm, worked long hours, and again, patriarchy, without any disrespect to Warren, um, it became her, by default, it became her responsibility to cook. Again, she was adept. Again, it's a sense of obligation, but it's a sense of validation. But she was the one who had to cook. So as they are making today's recipe, she is, I believe this is the second time that she has made it. She made it once over the, and that was what was happening over the phone on that first call. And then Christine basically said, can, you know, next time I'm home, can you make it and I'll film it or, or I'll take photos and I'll interview you while you do it. The idea of sort of ethnography on the spot. And so I think this is the second time that she made it where it's now at this point where she is starting to be a little bit more improvisatory and, you know, a bit fretful. She's making a half batch because she's not making it for a big special event. So she now has to have a recipe um, I'm going to start this. I'm going to cut this one again. Um, so she's going to have to have the recipe. So she's playing it by a little bit ear. I mean, it's not. It's more, especially when the uh, preparation, when the list of ingredients isn't necessarily an exact measure. So everything done 50%. She needs to sort of on the fly. But she's good at that. But she's nervous while doing so. And it's a nervousness that Christine notices is not typical for her. She's a confident cook. The confidence is one of the things that is her benchmark that she can adapt and she can adapt easily and cleverly. She can improvise on the spot and she can meet expectations, but this is a special dish. This is a dish that has uh, connotations. It is a dish that has resonance. It is a dish that has a very specific audience in mind, i.e. Warren. And over her life, over her uh, adult life, while she gets validation and she gets, you know, that the general satisfaction, the general recognition that we get, will often give in terms of the people who prepare our food. Um, nevertheless, she can grow tired of it. She goes a little bit, I don't think they ever use the word resentful and resentful wouldn't be the appropriate word anyway, but the, uh, a sort of a the ongoing expectation can be a little bit 
uh, wearisome in terms of her having to uh, continually uh, meet the expectations of, of uh, the meet the expectations the, the taste expectations the aesthetics of others because that is part of her responsibility when we compare it to Warren's cooking and with here we can think about what Thomas Adler said uh, almost 40 years ago in his um, uh, making pancakes on Sunday article where again talking about male chefs and families and that they have all status accorded to them for their one special meal. Meals that are, uh, n they are not expected to make b by virtue of their position in the household, so that when they do make it, attention is drawn to the, to the meal in and of itself. It is special by virtue of it being made by father. It is um, special also in part because father is busy doing other things, so it takes place on weekends or holidays. Similar to what's happening with Warren, and when he's making the Chaldean food, and he's making it um, when it fits within his work schedule. So Beth is continually making food for her family uh, within the ebb and flow of the week and her own responsibilities. And does the fact that she works at home does not mean that the work that she does at home is not work. And yet she still has that expectation. It doesn't mean that she doesn't get satisfaction from it, but it can be starting to wane. And so what I like about this, and I think it's subtext in the article, because I, I read it again just before filming, and I was like, no, she doesn't say it, but I think it's implied that what we have here over and above a food article, we have this really interesting article about the general dynamics of folklore and repertoire adaptation. Because we have someone who has a facility uh, with, a per with a kind of performance, a genre of performance. So whether that is a singer, whether that is a storyteller, or whether that is a cook. Someone with a reputation for, com for competence. And yet, Dishes are like repertoires in that they tend to be in someone's uh, specific purview. Oh, that's dad's dish. Doubly so because of, um, I mean, doubly so when we're talking about gender, uh, when we have this already, it's, it's a framed event because it's special because dad does it. So um, such is the nature of the, uh, the enterprise at this point such as the nature of the enterprise. My God, that's pretentious of me to say it that way. Let me start. No, I'm not going to start again because I know what I'm talking about. Um, so his dish is already marked as special. Uh, rep but repertoires tend to be cleaving. If you have like a family, uh, a, a, a regular family occasion, often you know uh, where extended family might get together, sometimes this thing is this person's special dish and everyone everyone knows not to bring this because this is what Aunt Glennis brings to, to, the, to, the, to the table. And it's like, everyone loves it. Everyone also knows not to make it because that's her thing. Um, and that is what would have been the case. Doubly so, and this is now fraught, because we're dealing with identity markers. We're dealing with heritage dishes. We're dealing with a food ways, a kind of food waste performance, which is Warren and his kids, and Warren and his extended family making something that is expressly in part the uh, rites of intensification, the reaffirmation of, of the uh, Chaldean identity. And, um, uh, which is not hers. And, that this event, this kind of cooking, had never been something that she had participated in before, in before out of some kind of respect, out of some kind of deference to, and this is something that Warren is, wants to do and communicate with the kids, and that is good and noble and fine, and she's completely content. And now we're seeing this transference. We're seeing her take tentative steps into... Um, claiming someone else's item for potential entry into her own repertoire, which he seems to be okay with, but she had to ask permission. I love that little bit, because again, the, the deep reading that Christine does, 
where um, the certain kinds of tomatoes in the stew and garlic in the stew, she said, you need this, you need garlic. And because that's just what we do, that's the nature of it. In a way, let's put garlic in stuff because garlic is inherently good. And, uh, but she knows that garlic is needed, yet she still needed to, in her words, get his permission, which speaks volumes. So what we have, as I say, in terms of not simply a food ways, but a general issue, a general article in the concept of repertoire, is that, as I said, we have the second stage. We have the first tentative performance, which is off stage. We don't see it because we don't have the access to the ethnographic now, but it's certainly implied that basically she slavishly followed the example. This is how this, is how this dish tastes. I am using your recipe in order to do it. How did I do? The second one is a little bit more fluid. It is still tentative. It's still uh, something where she does not feel comfortable demonstrating certain levels of improvisation and, and adaptation, but a little bit. She's starting to make it her own. And now we have this implied third and all other subsequent where just like the first time you tell a story, you might be very conservative in doing it because you want to tell it right. Then you start tentatively making changes so it fits your aesthetics. And then eventually you make that story your own. She's going to be doing the same thing with this dish. You have the feeling. And so often in folklore, and again, this transcends the study of food, but oh, the fact that it's done through food is just so glorious. And the study of folklore is the study of how repertoires move from person to person, how these things not uh, get transmitted. If transmission, the fact that it takes place at one point and then it takes place by someone else at another point is one of the hallmarks of folklore. This is an article that's about transmission. I haven't even talked, well, I've spoken a little bit about the gender dynamics that are in play that are the, the, the text of this. I mean, her subtitle is Power Dynamics and Gender Roles in Making Home of the Kibbeth. So it's all there and I have hinted at it. Uh, and that's another of the dynamics. So I'm going to stop in part because I have made a, a baker's dozen of, as you might be able to tell, increasingly large meatballs. Um, I think I'm also at about the half hour mark, something like that. And that's, that's frankly just far too much meatball talk for one, one person. And I have leftover meat. And quite frankly, when the camera's off, I'm going to eat this with a spoon. So Christine's article touches on so much of what we want to think about when we think about food in that we want to remember that it is the process of, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an experience that we can revisit to, um, and revisit a culture. There's a, tourist, a culinary tourism aspect to this. Uh, we can revisit a culture, we can re-engage a culture, we can revive a culture through its foods and that is sensory. It is also malleable. It's what goes forward. First of all, not the entire Chaldean repertoire is repeated or perhaps only those ones that are seen as extra special. And they might be adapted to palates. They might be adapted to health concerns. They might be adapted to local, uh, just local provisions. What is available? Uh, this calls for a particular, the, the recipe that I was following from the website calls for a particular spice that is not available in Cape Breton. So I replaced it with allspice. And quite frankly, it smells amazing because allspice is just the best thing. But um, uh, the, the adaptation, the adaptability are all part and parcel uh, of this process. So it's not cast in stone. And who does it? Why people do it? How things enter into, drop out of, and then reemerge in food repertoires? What are the dynamics? What are the purposes? What is being celebrated? What is being silenced? All of this is happening. And so, as I said, there are many, many reasons to like this article um, because it touches on so many different things. But this is one 
afternoon in Detroit. All of this takes place in one afternoon. I guess she did the interview a couple of days later, but this one food event takes place one afternoon in Detroit between two people uh, and within a family of a handful of people, but with an extended family of a number of people and of course within generations. But it's just a reminder that looking at the micro, looking at the micro, uh, the specific, the, the one uh, in great detail is in some ways sufficient to have a discussion about almost every particular aspect of food that you can possibly imagine. So as I said, I'm done. I'm going to freeze these according to instructions. Uh, I'm going to make the soup some other time. Uh, but I'll throw a camera up and see how it goes. Uh, so this has been Christine J. Widmeyer's Just a Dish, Power Dynamics and Gender Roles in Making Hometh Kiba. My name is Ian. As ever, my friends, I wish you nothing but the best. Be well and eat well, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.